eat each other when they were hungry. Their stomachs started to twist from hunger, and that's when the men started to eye each other. After he was discharged from the Union Army for epilepsy, Alfred headed west, hoping to strike it rich. He heard there was gold in them hills, and he'd come down with a case of gold fever. In November of 1873, a group of around 20 men set off from Salt Lake City towards the gold fields of Breckenridge, Colorado. They too had heard that there was gold in these them hills and that a massive fortune had been discovered. The men were all strangers to each other and they kind of rallied together under this guy named Bob McGrew who was willing to lead anyone that wanted to follow him. A man who was originally with a party but turned around so that the group ran into Alfred Packer around 25 miles from their starting point. He asked where they were going and if he could join them. What, they just found this suit along the way? The men were a little worried about taking Alfred with them because he didn't have any money or supplies, but Alfred started cooking up a story about how he was a prospector and guide and knew the San Juan territory really well. I know this town like the back of my hand. The men knew very little of Colorado's geography and they kind of looked at each other and were like, well, if he says so. And so Alfred Packer was officially a part of the group. Unfortunately, Alfred didn't know Jack Fruit about the Colorado wilderness either. Members of the original party later said he really over-exaggerated his qualifications and experience. In fact, they believe he fabricated his stories altogether just so he could join the team. The group said Alfred didn't even have a rifle on him when they left, only a revolver which made him question his story of being a well-traveled wilderness guide. Throughout the journey, Alfred was not being a team player. He was greedy with rations, a beggar, lazy, and obstinate. Apparently, he fought constantly with this one guy in the group named Frank Miller, and people said he was a big whiner. They also said his seizures made his presence in the group very strenuous. On top of that, the group had not made as much progress as they'd hoped towards Colorado, and just like the House of Stark, they knew that winter was coming. By this point, things were starting to look bleak. The wagons and horses were getting bogged down in the mud and snow, and the heavy snowfall was starting to make it impossible for them to see the trail they were following, so they started to rely solely on their compass. Zoink, Scoob! Alfred was still trying to lead the herd, but it was quite apparent now that he was a fraud and the party had become hopelessly lost. Provisions started to run out, and the men had to spend a long time surviving only on horse feed. Then they got to the point where the horses themselves were the next item on the list to be eaten. On January 21st, 1874, the party came upon an encampment near Montrose, Colorado, run by Chief Ure. The men were nearly hallucinating from starvation, but still tread carefully upon the camp, not knowing how the tribe would receive them. Apparently, when the tribe came out, the haggard appearance of the prospectors literally sent some of the tribe members running in fear. But Chief Ure greeted them as welcome guests and supplied them with food and lodging. His encampment was even known as the White Man's Friend, which is a bit on the nose, but I think it gets his point across. So the men were astonished at the chief's generosity, but graciously accepted his offerings. Chief Uray told them that they should postpone the expedition until the spring, saying that the winter weather in the mountains was way too dangerous. He told them that not even his men would chance such a journey, and that to risk it would be certain mortality. He offered for the men to stay with his tribe until winter had passed, and said he had enough supplies to last them. But oh, these men, they had a fever and the only prescription was mining for gold. They were convinced that if they waited out the winter, all the gold would be gone from Breckenridge, having been mined by all the prospectors. After a couple of weeks with Chief Uray, the party got together and discussed whether they should leave. It was the beginning of February now and the snow had been relentless. It was decided that half of the party would stay put with the wagons and horses until the spring and the other half would journey on. 11 men in total were selected to journey on, including Alfred the Turd. They had to have been drawing straws for who had to sit in the wagon with him. They first planned to travel to the closest outpost to their camp and then to Breckenridge from there. Chief Uray tried to convince the 11 not to go, but once he saw they weren't changing their minds, he was like, "I." It's your funeral. And then my beloved, beautiful Chief Uray gave them food for their journey as well as safe directions that bypassed the mountains because he's just the best. And with that, the men were off to face whatever was waiting for them in the Colorado wilderness. The group followed Chief Uray's directions of going around the mountains until Alfred one day spoke up and was like, um, actually, we should go through the mountains. It's a more direct route. And the guys were like, didn't we establish you know nothing? Uray's directions involved following the Gunnison River along its banks, and they felt they couldn't get lost if they did this. But Packer insisted that he knew the country really well and that his way straight through the mountains was quicker. Five men were in favor of Uray's directions, and Alfred was able to convince five other men to go through with him. The five that chose to follow the Gunnison River had a rough journey themselves. They had a 75 mile journey ahead of them led by the local mom friend of the group, Bob McGrew. Bob led the party along the river route until his horses couldn't continue. Bob then unloaded the rest of the men's provisions, told them good luck, and returned back to Uray's camp. 
The remainder of the river group was met with bad weather and freezing temperatures, and their provisions started to run out before they reached their destination. They were nearing starvation when they were rescued by some cowhands that came upon them by chance. The cowhands gave them food and shelter, and the group stayed with them until later that April. But if only Alfred's group had fared so lucky. On February 9th, Alfred and his group of five left for the Los Pinos Indian Agency, intending to journey through the mountains to reach it. The men continued along the river path a little bit until Alfred took the party along a path that started to lead them high up into the San Juan Mountains, completely disregarding all of Yure's warnings. At that point in time, supplies were scarce. The men barely had enough food to cover two weeks. They didn't have snowshoes, and they only had a few matches, but had no flint. There was not nearly enough winter clothing for the severe temperatures they would be facing. The five went into the mountains with two rifles, one pistol, a couple of blades, a hatchet, barely any ammunition, and a partridge in a pear tree. Just kidding about that last one. But what happened next? No one will ever truly know for sure. Two months later, Alfred Packer stumbled out of the mountains and towards the Los Pinos Indian Agency in Colorado with rags wrapped around his feet in place of shoes. And if there's one thing Alfred knew how to do, it was to make an entrance. He flung the door open to the mess hall where there were all these other men eating breakfast with his raggedy looking shoes and screamed at them for food and shelter. Immediately, the men rushed him inside and sat him down at a table and gave him some food, which he immediately tossed back up as quickly as he ate it. After he threw back a few shots of Jack, he started to tell the men his tale. He claimed that he'd been hired by five men to guide them through the wilderness from Uray's camp to Breckenridge. He said that during the journey, he became snow blind and was lagging behind the party and starting to become a burden on them. Alfred claimed the party gave him a rifle and then abandoned him, where he was forced to survive on his own and make his way out of the mountains with pretty much no supplies. He claimed he survived on nothing but roots and rosebuds and was completely alone for two months in the wilderness. The men listened to his story and were immediately suspicious. For a guy who survived on nothing but roots and roses, he sure looked well fed to them. He also in no way resembled the men they'd come across who had actually been stranded in the mountains. Those guys looked super malnourished with threadbare clothes and nearly no wits left about them. Alfred also told the men that he was broke and sold the rifle in his possession for $10 so he could buy some things when he went into town. Alfred stayed at the agency for 10 days before he told the men he wanted to go back home to Pennsylvania, so he headed into town to buy supplies for his journey. Cause it went so well the first time, right? But as soon as Alfred got into town, all of a sudden he started dropping all of this money left and right at the saloons and stores. As soon as he started throwing a couple back at the old saloon, his lips got all loosey goosey and he gave a different conflicting story about what happened in the mountains. People in town also started to notice that Alfred had several different wallets in his possession that he was paying from. With rumors swirling about his inconsistent stories, somehow endless cash flow and the apparent vanishing of the rest of his party, people quickly started to turn on old Alfred. When three of the original party members who had stayed at Uray's camp arrived in town, they spotted Alfred drinking and gabbing away at the saloon. The men approached Packer and asked him where the rest of the party was and he told him the story about how they abandoned him with nothing but a rifle. He told them he had no idea where they went and that he was forced to carry on surviving on nothing but rosebuds and the occasional squirrel. Once again, the men thought that this was a weird story and they too believed Alfred looked way too well fed for the supposed diet he lived on. Can roses even survive that kind of winter? They also thought it was odd for the five men to surrender one rifle to Alfred, leaving only one rifle left between the rest of them. When two more men from the party that took the river route heard the story Alfred was telling people, they immediately warned the head of the agency that he was not to be trusted. They claimed that the men who went with Alfred would never desert one of their own and that they were suspicious something had happened in the mountains. The other men from the party who had seen Alfred at the saloon noticed how a bunch of the items in his possession used to belong to all different members of the party of five. The men convinced General Adams, the head of the agency, to bring in Alfred for questioning and to send a search party into the mountains to look for the rest of the group. Alfred was gathering his things to head out of town when he was approached by some men and dragged back to the agency. There, he came face to face with General Adams and the five men from the other half of his search party who he hadn't seen since they split at the river. And he's like, oh hey besties, what's up? They accused him of lying and demanded the truth from him, bringing up the multiple witnesses who had seen him with several wallets and personal possessions that didn't appear to be his. They also asked him how he was able to spend hundreds of dollars in town when he claimed to be penniless at the beginning of the expedition. General Adams assembled a council with Alfred, the miners, and the agency officials to settle the matter when it was suddenly reported that two men from the local tribe had found something on a hill near the agency. They described it as white man's meat. Mm. Apparently, the tribesmen ran into the room and held up these two strips of dried human flesh and Alfred fainted. Honestly, we can't be sure if this is someone just exaggerating the details as the years have passed or if this actually happened, but I'm honestly living for the drama of it all. They revived Alfnerd and he told them he would confess and that it wasn't the first time people were forced to eat each other when they were hungry. 
He said the men did not bring enough food for what they thought would be a 14-day journey. The rough terrain and the energy it took to traverse it meant they ran out of food fast. Alfred claimed they survived on roots, roses, pine gum, and the occasional rabbit, but after a while, their stomachs started to twist from hunger. And that's when the men started to eye each other. One day while gathering firewood, Alfred said he came back to find four of the men gathered around the body of a man named Israel Swan, who had been struck in the head with a hatchet. The four started to butcher up Israel, and Alfred accepted the situation and joined them. They found several thousands of dollars on him and divided the money up between them, with Alfred keeping Swan's rifle. Seems like the gold in the hills was just the friends they ate along the way. The men ate most of the agreeable parts of Swan, packed up the rest, and were on their way. But they quickly ran out of meat after two days. And that's when Alfred claimed the men started whispering about their next victim, Frank Miller, who they allegedly selected because he was stockier and chosen for the amount of soft flesh he had. It was one blow to the head from the hatchet and Frank and Beans was the next on the menu. The men did their thing, divided his possessions, and Alfred got his knife because he said he'd always admired it. Well, the winter was brutal, the wind pierced their exposed skin, and they could barely see in front of them. James Humphrey was the next to go, followed by George Noon, and finally it was down to Shannon Bell and Alfred Packer. Alfred said they swore to Almighty God that they wouldn't eat each other, but after a few days of trekking with nothing but roots in their stomachs, the men were starting to go mad with hunger. Alfred claimed that Shannon snapped and started to charge at Alfred with his rifle, so Alfred grabbed the hatchet and whacked Shannon over the head. And, well, Alfred wasn't one to waste food, so he claimed he took the rest of the money and possessions off of Shannon, packed up what food he could, and walked through the mountains until he eventually saw the agency. The strips of flesh that the tribesmen had found were what Alfred had discarded as soon as he had seen the agency, but that was what he had ultimately been surviving on until then. Those who heard the story did not like it one bit and they erupted with anger, calling him a liar and a monster. The search party was immediately assembled to try and find the remains of the men and the vague whereabouts Alfred had described. What they discovered in those them hills would give a whole new meaning to the phrase bone appetite. That following August, an illustrator who worked for Harper's Weekly magazine would stumble upon all five bodies of the men neatly laid together in a gulch near Lake City, Colorado. This is the location where Alfred had claimed only Shannon Bell had met his end. He sketched the horrific scene of the bodies in excruciating detail and immediately alerted the authorities, while the sketch was published in the papers months later. A search party went out, and sure enough, they found the five bodies in multiple states of decomposition. The scene told a completely different story of what had happened during those last two months than what Alfred had described. A beaten path from the men's bodies led to a makeshift shelter that was used by Alfred and contained some of the men's possessions. There was evidence to suggest that they hadn't yet exhausted their supplies when the men were slain, which helped them form a theory. Their theory was that Alfred attacked the men with a hatchet before their supplies ran out so he could steal their possessions and money before they made it into town. However, he got so snowed in so he had to outlast the winter for two months in his little shelter, and the past suggested that he would walk back and forth whenever he was hungry to go slice off another piece of meat to cook up for himself. Have I mentioned lately how grateful I am that this is a plant-based cooking show? I could not be making steak carnitas at a time like this. The party's remains were buried and the search party returned only to find Alfred was missing from his jail cell. But months had passed while they searched for the bodies and somehow Alfred had managed to slip away. Eventually, Alfred turned back up in 1883 when he was discovered living under a fake name in Wyoming and was brought back to Denver for another trial. After a seven day trial, Alfred was found guilty of premeditated homie against Israel Swan and was sentenced to hang for his crimes. Due to some sort of legal technicality, his life was spared when his sentence was converted to 40 years in prison. But that wasn't the end for our man munching monster. In 1901, Alfred's parole was granted after he served only 18 years of his 40-year sentence. Allegedly, Alfred had become a vegetarian, lived out a quiet, peaceful life during the remainder of his days until he passed of what was reported on his certificate as dementia, trouble, and worry. Honestly, same. It's crazy to think that if the group hadn't split up and several members hadn't turned back multiple times, we might not have ever heard of this story in the first place. Well, it's time to try out one of these delicious jackfruit tacos. Don't worry, no jacks were harmed in the making of these tacos. See you next time.